Welcome everyone. I'm Kelly O'Brien with Us Against Alzheimer's and I lead our brain health and early intervention work. For those of you who don't know us well, Us Against Alzheimer's exists to conquer Alzheimer's disease. We take on the toughest problems bringing all of us together to break down barriers. We work in partnership with many, many others to get the job done. We work to improve brain health and promote earlier detection, diagnosis, and intervention, champion health equity and access for communities of color and women who are disproportionately impacted by Alzheimer's and dementia, advocate for increased research that will speed treatments to market, and drive changes that matter most to people living with the disease. I just have a couple of uh, housekeeping items as we begin the webinar this morning. Um, you'll be all, you're all on mute. Um, and you can, however, submit questions um, throughout the uh, webinar through the chat. So please do feel free to utilize the chat. It'll be a great way for us to connect with you during the session and to pick up questions at the end of the webinar. Um, and we hope we will have time for questions. I wanna, you know, on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you for joining this briefing on the impact of the social determinants of health on brain health and Alzheimer's. Uh, as we all know, the social determinants of health are factors that intersect with the healthcare system, things such as racism and poverty, housing and access to food, access to healthcare and places to get exercise. These are in essence, things that make up place, places where people live, work and play. Brain health is the ability to think clearly, learn and remember as well as motor and emotional functioning. A good deal of research has shown that where we live, work, and play has a large impact on our brain health and our risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. And those who are adversely impacted tend to be communities of color, traditionally marginalized communities. To help synthesize this and focus policy efforts, we've taken data and mapped it by geography, and today we're going to present it by congressional districts as well. The good news is that there are things that we can do, including investing in public health, improving educational and economic opportunities where they are needed most, addressing health risk factors for Alzheimer's and dementia that are also more prevalent in these communities, such as hyper, hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. Today, we're grateful to have with us um, two members of Congress who have been working to do exactly these kinds of things, education, jobs, healthcare, rep, Linda Sanchez from California's 38th district. And we have a video message from Rep. Forsberg from Nevada's fourth. I first want to introduce Representative Sanchez who represents California's 38th congressional district, sits on the House Ways and Means Committee where she advocates for the protection of social security and Medicare, fairness for US workers and business and trade agreements and an even playing field for the middle class through tax reform. As a current member of Commerce, Congress and former labor lawyer, Representative Sanchez has doted, devoted her career to helping working people get ahead, advocating for working families, improving America's education system and bringing jobs to Southern California. After seeing two parents through Alzheimer's disease and serving as a caregiver herself, Rep Sanchez is a critical leader and supporter of the Alzheimer's prevention and early detection. We're honored to have her open this briefing. Representative Sanchez. And you're, you're on mute, Representative Sanchez. Wow, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Kelly, um, and good afternoon to everyone. I'm really happy to be joining you today, and I want to begin by thanking all of those at Us Against Alzheimer's, the researchers, and our speakers for making today's briefing possible. Um, to, today's briefing is important for many reasons but in particular because it sheds light on what we can do to address, not just discuss, health inequities that exist for families that are impacted by Alzheimer's disease. As it stands, approximately 6.2 million Americans aged 65 or older are living with Alzheimer's disease. And women and communities of color face disproportionate impacts of this disease. But Alzheimer's and related dementias don't just affect the person that's living with the disease, um, I'm a working mom whose mother currently has Alzheimer's, and I know all too well the devastating toll that Alzheimer's can have on primary caregivers and families as a whole. 
caring for a loved one um, when you don't know if it's going to be a good day or a hard day can be overwhelming and at times it can be really heart-wrenching. And that's just one of the challenges that patients and families face. There are also financial impacts that really can be detrimental um, to families and to the person living with the disease. Within the next decade, Black and Latino families are gonna face a dis disproportionate burden of the disease and the challenges that come with it. The research that is gonna be discussed today shows that in the next decade, nearly 40% of all Americans living with Alzheimer's will be either Black or Latino. So we have to think critically about these disparities and we have to take action now to try to close those gaps in diagnosis, treatment, and care. One thing that we can do to make life easier for patients and caregivers is to ensure that they have access to the information and support they need as early as possible. And that's why I am proud to lead the CHANGE Act, the concentrating on high value Alzheimer's needs to get an end. This bipartisan and bicameral bill would encourage early assessment and diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. Specifically, it would strengthen existing tools in Medicare to screen and detect these diseases in their earliest stages. As millions more Americans, particularly in communities of color, are expected to be diagnosed, it's vital that every family have early access to the care and the resources that they need. Early diagnosis is just one of the many ways that we can take action to address health inequities. And there is so much more that needs to be done, but we cannot do this alone. And that's why I'm always proud to partner with Us Against Alzheimer's and the organizations that are represented today to discuss additional ways in which we can address brain health and equity. We have a wonderful panel of experts to guide this conversation today. And I wanna thank all of them and all of you for engaging in today's discussion. Together, we will continue to make progress to address the needs of Alzheimer's patients and to better support their families. Thank you so much for including me today, and I hope you have a wonderful discussion of the information that will be presented. Take care. Thank you so much, Representative Sanchez, for your leadership and your collaboration on all of these issues and for being with us today. Now I would also like to rep acknowledge uh, Representative Horsford, another advocate for working families. He was unable to be with us live today, but did uh, provide us with a, a brief video message. He too has been working to strengthen the social safety net, support small businesses, improve job training and address food insecurity. Um, and uh, we're grateful that he was uh, able to share with us a few words. Hello, I'm Congressman Stephen Horsford, and I represent Nevada's 4th Congressional District. I'm glad to be able to address you all as we discuss the importance of health equity. My Congressional District is one of 25 across the country with the highest prevalence of Alzheimer's among Black and Latino Americans. So this crisis is very real. Black and Latino Americans live with a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's or dementia and too often face barriers that prevent them from receiving a timely diagnosis or quality treatment and care. These barriers stem from social determinants of health, the conditions in the environments where people are born, live, work, go to school, and more that affect their quality of life and their health. Addressing these barriers starts with giving people time off to see the doctor and time to care for their loved ones when they need support. That's why I'm working with President Biden to pass the American Families Act, which will provide all Americans with paid family and medical leave. I look forward to continuing to work with partners like U.S. Against Alzheimer's to address health inequities and to make communities more just for all. Thank you. Hello, I'm Con Terrific. What a uh, wonderful message. Okay. Now, uh, we're excited to dive in. We have a very rich uh, panel with us today. Um, and I wanna turn this over to my colleague, um, Jason Resendez, who leads Us Against Alzheimer's Center for Brain Health Equity. Jason is an incredible leader and advocate, uh, Google Next Generation Policy Leader, an Aspen Ideas Fellow, 
Um, Jason founded a Latinos Against Alzheimer's and has helped make he health equity a central part of the Us Against Alzheimer's a, a mission and focus for the last decade. Um, so Jason, um, thanks so much for all that you've done and I'm gonna turn this over to you. Great, thanks so much, uh, Kelly uh, and everyone. Uh, so amazing to come after these champions uh, on the Hill fighting for what we call brain health equity at Us Against Alzheimer's. Next slide. And that call to action is so critical. As Representative Sanchez highlighted, we project that by 2030, nearly 40% of all Americans living with Alzheimer's will be Black or Latino. Uh, this is a trend that we must act on today in order to avoid tomorrow. Uh, next slide. As we think about the impact of Alzheimer's on these communities, uh, we know that Latinos are one and a half times more likely to develop Alzheimer's as non-Hispanic whites. We know that Black Americans are two times more likely to develop Alzheimer's as non-Hispanic whites. And as we try to understand you know, what is driving that risk, there's been a lot of focus on the biological factors uh, that uh, shape that risk. Um, one, looking at comorbidities, and you'll see on the slide a number of comorbid risk factors for Alzheimer's um, that contribute to this risk, but that's only part of the story. Next slide. We're learning more and more about how place and the social determinants of health shape dementia risk. This area of research is becoming increasingly important. The NIA, for example, has recognized the importance of geographic variation in understanding dementia risk and the development of its research agenda. And emerging research from institutions like the University of Wisconsin shows us that factors like community level disadvantage might play a role in shaping Alzheimer's risk. So there is a growing uh, focus on factors beyond biology that contribute to disparities uh, experienced by Black Americans, Latinos, but other communities of colors uh, as well, including LGBTQ Americans. And so it's vital that we think about this challenge, the Alzheimer's challenge, through a health equity lens and through a place-based lens. Next slide. Despite this growing consensus around the importance of place in addressing Alzheimer's, we've not done a good enough job as a field of harnessing data on the social determinants of health and on community health and public health to address equity and access gaps in Alzheimer's. That's why we launched the National Alzheimer's Disease Index and the Us Against Alzheimer's Center for Brain Health Equity, which is partially supported by the CDC's Healthy Brain Initiative. It's through this project that we're focused on turning data into action-based insights uh, to drive uh, partnerships um, and initiatives at the local level uh, to close these equity and access gaps. We started by developing a set of data-based insights, which we'll talk about today uh, with the Urban Institute and support from our strategic partner, the National Minority Quality Forum. Uh, we developed an analysis that looked at the top 25 counties most impacted by Alzheimer's among Black and Latino Americans in the Medicare program. Uh, we also identified the counties with the least prevalence of Alzheimer's among Blacks and Latino Americans in the Medicare program. And we did this to understand and start to explore, one, the geography. Where are these counties from a geographic perspective? But then also to understand the social determinant factors present in these counties that are highly impacted by Alzheimer's. Uh, and what we found, I think, was really striking. Next slide. What we found in these highly impacted counties were worse social determinant of health outcomes than counties with the least prevalence of the disease. We saw this across a number of social determinant factors. Uh, so we combined the Medicare data that we looked at uh, with other public health data, publicly available data from sources like the Robert Wood Johnson County Health Rankings, for example. And we looked at social determinant factors and how they were present in highly impacted counties um, compared to the least impacted counties across the demographic groupings that we were looking at. So Black, uh, Latino, Black Americans, Latino Americans, and non-Hispanic White Americans. And what we found 
again, were these stark differences uh, in the social determinant of health outcomes across these county groupings. So for example, in counties with the highest prevalence of Alzheimer's among Blacks and Latinos, uh, we saw more families living in poverty. We saw lower household uh, median incomes. We saw more individuals living without health insurance. We found that individuals in counties with the highest prevalence of Alzheimer's among Black and Latino Americans had fewer opportunities to exercise. Uh, next slide. We also saw this when it comes to education, education being a critical factor uh, and a widely recognized important social determinant of health factor. We saw across the board for the black county groupings, the Latino county groupings, and the non-Latino white county groupings that for those families living in the counties with the highest prevalence of the disease, we saw uh, lower uh, levels of educational attainment compared to counties with the lowest prevalence of Alzheimer's. So why does this matter? It matters for a couple of reasons. Next slide. While we don't claim that these factors cause Alzheimer's, we know from research that these factors are interlinked. And uh, the Lancet Commission recently uh, released a, a, a comprehensive review of Alzheimer's research and prevention research and found that up to 40% of dementia cases could be prevented by addressing lifestyle factors. So there's an emergence, as Kelly uh, alluded to earlier in the webinar, an emerging focus on risk reduction and lifestyle modification to address cognitive health over the lifespan. This is an important and hopeful message. Um, when you look at the Lancet Commission, they identified a number of factors uh, that can be uh, addressed to reduce risk for dementia in later life, things like increasing educational attainment, increasing physical activity, increasing social contact, while at the same time decreasing things like um, smoking, obesity, uh, exposure to air pollution. But at the same time, if you look at our data, we see that so many of these factors are shaped uh, by social issues, are shaped by you know, deep social inequities uh, when it comes to things like the ability to uh, have higher levels of uh, uh, social contact or the ability to exercise, right? In these counties with the highest impact of Alzheimer's among uh, communities of color, we see fewer opportunities to take advantage of this hopeful messaging that really is beyond the control of an individual. So it really underscores the importance of investing in a public health response and investing uh, in infrastructure to address uh, these systemic inequities. Uh, this data also demonstrates just how under-resourced these highly, impact, highly impacted counties are, which is really critical as we develop policy recommendations, as we develop public health interventions to take into consideration the realities on the ground in these highly impacted counties. Uh, next slide. To build on this analysis, we partnered with the National Minority Quality Forum to identify the congressional districts that represent these top 25 county groupings. Our goal was to further educate policymakers about the impacts of Alzheimer's on their districts and to continue to collect data to inform policy recommendations and public health interventions. So when we look at the county groupings, again, we took those top 25 county groupings for Black Americans and Latino Americans, and then worked with the National Minority Quality Forum through our National Alzheimer's Disease Index to identify the congressional districts that are representing those highly impacted counties. And we looked at this by grouping by uh, Black American county groupings and by Latino American county groupings uh, and looked at the district level data uh, when it comes to Alzheimer's in the Medicare program to understand the impacts of the disease. So this slide uh, lists out the uh, top 25 uh, districts uh, among Black Americans. Uh, you'll see a lot of representation from Texas um, but then also as, doc, as uh, Representative Horsford uh, highlighted, also from Nevada and the Nevada 4th District and uh, a, a lot of folks um, in between. Uh, and so uh, we also did this for, next slide. 
the Latino American uh, grouping as well. No surprise, Florida uh, is highly impacted. In fact, the number one most impacted county in the US being Miami-Dade. Um, we see Florida 27th, 26th, um, right up there at the very top, but then also uh, a diverse representation geographically in terms of uh, impact. And it's just interesting to see what the geographic distribution is of these districts. And what we wanted to do beyond understanding geography was also to look at what is the uh, overarching data themes that we find. So next slide. When we account for uh, duplicates, so uh, districts that might represent the same county, for example, we have a total of 41 districts uh, with a total number of individuals or Medicare beneficiaries living with Alzheimer's totaling about 350,000 Medicare beneficiaries. This 350,000 uh, Americans living with Alzheimer's uh, cost the Medicare program about $8.5 billion in 2016. Um, when you look at Alzheimer's prevalence uh, on average across these districts, it's about 9.5%. And when we looked at what is the average uh, cost spent on uh, Medicare dollars spent on these beneficiaries in these districts, it was about 26%. And this is what we think is the most interesting, is this outsized impact that this population is having on the Medicare program. So while less than 10% on average of these districts have um, uh, individuals living with Alzheimer's and related dementias, nearly a quarter of the Medicare costs uh, spent in those districts are being spent on beneficiaries living with Alzheimer's and related dementias. Uh, so this further underscores the importance of addressing Alzheimer's through things like early detection as Representative Sanchez mentioned, but also by improving our public health response uh, to Alzheimer's. Um, and that's why I'm excited to introduce our next speaker. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Karen Hacker, uh, Director of CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, a position she assumed in August 2019. The NCCDPHP it has an annual budget of around $1.2 billion and more than 1,000 staff members dedicated to preventing chronic diseases like Alzheimer's and to promoting health across the lifespan. From 2013 to 2019, Dr. Hacker served as director of the Allegheny County Health Department in Pennsylvania, where she was responsible for 1.2 million residents in 130 municipalities, including Pittsburgh. It is a pleasure to welcome Dr. Hacker to talk about the important role of public health in addressing our shared Alzheimer's challenge, particularly in communities of color. Over to you, Dr. Hacker, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I wanna thank Jason for his presentation, uh, which I think is quite uh, fascinating as we begin to understand this phenomenon. Um, and as you know, over 6 million Americans are currently living with Alzheimer's disease. And as Jason demonstrated for the first time, I should say, we have the socioeconomic profiles of counties across the nation that are impacted by Alzheimer's disease. Health disparities can have a profound negative effect on entire populations or individual communities, and dementia care and support services can vary widely, depending on race, ethnicity, geography, social and economic factors, access to care, a whole variety of, of factors. We also know that stigma and cultural differences, awareness and understanding about Alzheimer's disease and the related dementias can also be factors that lead to health disparities. In addition, the ability for a person to get a diagnosis, to manage their disease, and to be able to access quality healthcare and social services contributes to these health disparities. And these disparities reach beyond clinical care to include uneven representation of Black, Hispanic, Asian, and American Indian and Alaskan Natives in Alzheimer's research and in clinical trials. We know now that older Americans who are Black are twice as likely to have Alzheimer's disease as those who are white, and those who are Hispanic are about one and a half times as likely. While we can't say that location causes Alzheimer's disease, and I want to make sure you hear that, we can say that the data shows that counties with the highest prevalence tend to be negatively impacted by certain social determinants of health, such as having higher levels of poverty, 
fewer options for exercise and less education or poor education. Social determinants of health are conditions in the places where people live, learn, work, and play that affect a wide range of health and quality of life risks and outcomes. I've made social determinants of health a top priority for our center at CDC. And this is where our funded partners through the National Healthy Brain Initiative focusing on populations with the highest prevalence of dementia and the bold infrastructure for Alzheimer's Act, both the centers of excellence and the programs are focusing their work on social determinants of health. And with your help and theirs, in these communities, we can make a difference. We can increase early detection and diagnosis of Alzheimer's and related dementias. We can reduce the risk. We can reduce unnecessary hospitalizations. And we can support unpaid caregivers. For example, baby boomer caregivers like me who report more chronic disease, more disability, and lower self-rated uh, health compared to baby boomers who are not caregivers. Another social determinant of health that we are learning more about, especially during COVID-19, is the effect of social isolation and loneliness on older adults. Social isolation is associated with 50% increased risk of dementia. It also increases a person's risk of premature death from all causes, a risk that may rival those of smoking, obesity, and physical inactivity. And in addition to these determinants, people of color face another barrier, discrimination racial injustice. And when seeking health care for Alzheimer's, 50% of Black Americans and 33% of Hispanic Americans reported high rates of discrimination when compared to their white counterparts. People of color said their top concern is that providers or staff do not listen to what they are saying because of their race, their color, or their ethnicity. And it is projected that people of color will account for over half of the population by 2050. CDC and our partners have expertise in creating and disseminating impactful and culturally appropriate public health messaging. We're focused on leveling channels and partner resources in your communities so that we can together improve public health. We collect data through the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System or the BRFSS. The BRFSS is coordinated by CDC with surveys conducted by individual state and jurisdiction health departments. CDC's Alzheimer disease program uses this data to create easy to understand state level infographics uh, showing the number of people experiencing memory loss, as well as providing information about their caregivers too. The program stratifies data into categories showing the impact on African-Americans, Hispanic adults, rural populations, LGBT populations, veterans, men, and women. And this information is also available on the Alzheimer's data portal at cdc.gov backslash aging. Chronic disease and cognitive decline are serious public health issues and people are living longer. And by 2030, about one in five Americans will be age 65 or older. Older adults are at significant risk of having multiple chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, cancer, arthritis. For some people, these concerns are further compounded by memory loss. When cognition is impaired, it can have a profound effect on a person's overall health and well being, including essential activities for daily living, like cooking, managing medicines. And people with chronic physicians who also have Alzheimer's or other dementias have a higher use and cost of healthcare services than people with these conditions who don't have Alzheimer's. CDC and our partners produced a series of aging and health in American data briefs, all publicly available that provide health professionals with the most recent data on health and age-related conditions. For example, among adults age 45 years and older with one or more chronic disease, more than 20% reported having subjective cognitive decline. So I can't overestimate the connection between chronic diseases and Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. There is a growing scientific evidence that healthy behaviors, which have been shown to prevent cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease may also reduce the risk of cognitive decline. So this is great news, and they possibly can impact dementia. The course of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia should be viewed as a continuum across the lifespan that begins with healthy cognitive functioning and goes on to the decline that we sometimes see. 
A recent study shows significant reductions in mild cognitive uh, decline uh, can be achieved by lowering systolic blood pressure. And CDC and our funded partners have the strength and capacity to advance awareness about the interplay between brain health and physical health, including tobacco prevention and control, blood pressure control, cardiovascular health management, diabetes prevention and management, obesity prevention and control, and injury prevention. So building upon this work, CDC co-led the committee of the Advisory Council on Alzheimer's Research Care and Services of the National Alzheimer's Project Act with Us Against Alzheimer's and the Alzheimer's Association in developing a national goal to address modifiable risk factors and protective factors that might prevent or delay the onset of Alzheimer's and associated dementias. The Healthy Brain Initiative state and local public health partnerships to address dementia, the 2018 to 2023 roadmap charts a course for state and local public health agencies and their partners to act quickly and strategically to prepare all communities to be dementia ready by stimulating changes in policies, systems, and environments. Many of the roadmap's 25 experts developed actions would accelerate risk reduction by promoting brain health. We need your continued assistance and commitment to improving the social determinants of health in these communities of color whose burden and suffering with Alzheimer's continues to grow. So I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Hunter, for your words and for your uh, amazing job at helping to strengthen the case for investing in our public health response to Alzheimer's and related dementia and to really refocus the conversation on the hopeful messages, the things that we can do while still understanding the barriers uh, to realizing that message that exists. And it's exactly why we're invested in doing this work alongside the CDC and the Healthy Brain Initiative. Now I'm pleased to introduce our close partner, Dr. Adriana Perez. Dr. Perez is an assistant professor and senior fellow at the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. Her program of research is focused on the influence of multi-level factors on physical activity, cognitive health, cardiovascular health, and sleep among Spanish-speaking older Latinos living with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Adriana is a close partner of Us Against Alzheimer's. We are so excited to have her talk about uh, the work that she's doing and the importance of focusing on risk modification, <clears throat> addressing the social determinants of health in communities of color. Over to you, Dr. Bettis. Thank you so much, Jason. It's an honor to join you, other colleagues and leaders promoting brain health equity. So today I'm going to share uh, information from a current study, Tiempo Juntos por Nuestra Salud, a physical activity intervention to promote cognitive health cardiovascular health and sleep in older Latinos with mild cognitive impairment. Next slide. This work is in partnership with a multidisciplinary team that you see here. Uh, we are very grateful for funding and support from the National Institute on Aging. Our team includes a diverse uh, team with summer undergraduate minority research scholars at the University of Pennsylvania. Next slide. Thank you. So uh, why, is, uh, why, is there, why is the focus on physical activity important? Uh, physical inactivity is a public health priority, especially for Latinx elder adults and other communities of color, those uh, experiencing mild cognitive impairment. This is a window of opportunity because MCI is considered the pre-dementia stage of Alzheimer's disease, and it increases the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Physical activity enhances cognition by improving health behaviors, including sleep, by reducing chronic conditions such as cardiovascular health that affect neurocognitive function. The uh, effects of physical activity on our health are enormous. There are many, many documented benefits. Uh, I mostly focus on these as they relate to cognitive health. But in this country, those 
who are more advantaged and more likely to be regularly physically active uh, are also those that experience uh, less adverse health outcomes associated with inactive lifestyles. And so in the Latinx community, we see that older adults here experience a disproportionate burden of cognitive disease, higher rates of inactivity and sleep-wake disturbances that are often associated with metabolic syndrome, diabetes, cardiovascular risk, and as a result, we see that their risk for developing Alzheimer's disease is very high. And unfortunately, less than 5% of Latinos are included in clinical trials that focus on Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. So I really see this as an opportunity for the scientific community, the um, clinicians to focus on prevention and risk quantification through physical activity as a cost-effective treatment versus long-term care utilization. Next slide. So when you, we think from a socio-ecological perspective, social determinants of health factors, in other words, uh, that are related to the social and physical envir environment impose a direct influence on the opportunity to engage in physical activity. From a neighborhood or community level perspective, uh, things like access to public green areas, provision of safe areas to walk, um, as well as the design of a residential area, which may or may not include walkable neighborhood routes that are especially critical for older adults who experience, who have other cognitive limitations or seeing, hearing impairments, as well as community traits, the uh, lack of social co cohesion, uh, the acknowledgement of perceived benefits of physical activities, uh, especially related to age. Uh, ethnic minority elders not only deal with racism, but they also have to deal with oftentimes ageism, where many programs do not consider their unique needs. Social inequalities, including income inequality. Jason, you outlined many of these aspects very well. Um, and so these aspects also have a effect on activity levels and sedentary behavior. In addition, lack of access to free and low cost linguistically and culturally relevant programs, including the opportunities to participate in research programs uh, is another barrier uh, that older Latinx individuals have to deal with. Interpersonal level factors, including the lack of supportive uh, family or community level networks that facilitate physical activity include aspects of social determinants of physical activity. Next slide. Uh, our grant included preliminary data in partnership with community organizations serving the Latinx community. Our community, a series of community-based focus groups found that memory health was rated as very high and important for Latinx elders and their families. It was a motivation to participate in physical activity. Uh, so their interest to preserve memory is very high. Uh, there's also a high interest to participate in research, but often they shared the lack of opportunities to do so. Limited physical activity programs available in Spanish. Indeed, our community assessment found that there were very little to no uh, Spanish uh, programs and those that were existing are no longer functioning, no longer supported or funded. Neighborhood concerns was also uh, uh, one of the outcomes of our focus groups. Elders talked about concerns for walking, especially if they're walking alone. And our data uh, using a geographic information system, so GIS mapping, found some additional community level factors that really highlight the need to test programs like Tiempo Juntos in this community. Our uh, GIS data found uh, low income, low resource neighborhoods, so these are the challenges that uh, the elders that we are focused on, these are the neighborhoods where they live, uh, neighborhoods with higher crime rates compared to white and non-Latinx elders. Uh, and there is an opportunity again here, we did find that there is there are areas where there is distance to green space available, which highlight again, the opportunities to promote group walking and very briefly in the next slides, I want to share an example of our GIS map um, in looking at three different areas that to us indicate the need for addressing environmental level factors if we want to promote physical activity. 
Here you see the location of our uh, study population in our preliminary data that lives in north, uh, northeastern part of Philadelphia. The light blue area indicates where mostly Hispanic Latinx elders live. The gray area indicates where mostly the black community and black elders live. And the green space shows where predominantly white elders live. The highest, uh, the darkest red shaded areas here show the higher density, population density by neighborhood. So you could see the disproportionate impact of population density on communities of color. In the next slide, you see pretty much the same trend that when it comes to crime, if you look at where the blue area is for Hispanic Latinx elders, as well as African-American black community, you see that the darkest shaded areas mean that these are elders that are living in areas with higher crime rates. And then the third map shows the location of participants by median house value. So the darker red shaded areas indicate the uh, you know, lower uh, median housing value. And you could see that pretty much this is a trend that uh, is consistent uh, among these neighborhoods. And next slide. So Tiempo Juntos provides an opportunity to address the, many of these social determinants of health. Here we're testing a Spanish language multi-level intervention to promote physical activity, cardiovascular health. You see there physical activity is our primary outcome. Uh, the effects on secondary outcomes of heart health sleep and cognitive function, we, uh, we are testing an individual wellness motivation theory where we are looking at mediators for health behavior change that include um, factors of interpersonal, intrapersonal, and community level strategies to promote physical activity over time. And we uh, are also looking at intervention costs, ultimately to uh, you know, it, the, science, it, the science is only good if it could be sustained. And I think in this case, we are um, calculating costs to show over time that focusing on prevention and supporting wellness programs in the long term uh, might potentially offset costs related to healthcare utilization. And last slide. Again, I wanna thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is the contact information. Uh, we believe that this study is uh, focusing on uh, social, addressing social determinants of health of physical activity can help improve cognitive health outcomes overall and cognitive health disparities. Thank you. Dr. Perez, thank you so much uh, for all the work that you're doing. Um, I know that you're engaged with us against Alzheimer's in so many different ways. Um, and your expertise in this particular area is of incredible value. Um, and just, I think I'm just struck by how the data that you presented and the data that Jason presented and Dr. Hacker, it really builds an incredible case for not only the problem and understanding and some clarity of places that we can focus and how we can focus our efforts and the opportunity that we have to really make a difference on some of, in some of these areas. Um, we, uh, we've got good information now. And I think the challenge that we all have is, is action, right? And using the data to actually change the current trajectory that we're on. Um, in terms of the health of um, an aging population. So I want to turn to that action question um, directly. Um, I saw um, Melody uh, Libby in the Q&A. That was your first question out of the box. And I'm going to start there with some, uh, a brief overview of some of the um, action items um, that we feel like policymakers should consider and advocates could support to help us actually put some of this data and this information um, to good use. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, um, Daphne, that would be great. Um, the first thing that um, we'll mention um, and Us Against Alzheimer's and many other groups have been consistently supporting of course, is continued research in this area. Um, there's been an incredible 
um, body of research around um, the social determinants of health and around uh, risk reduction, but not nearly enough. Um, we do not have nearly enough communities of color represented in clinical trials. And the uh, causal factors have not been as clearly identified as they need to be. So we are, as others, supporting a, an increase in funding for um, NIH research to the level of 289 million minimum. Um, the House did provide an increase in their recent appropriations um, work um, and so it, up 200 million. Um, so we're getting there, but definitely need more. Um, and we also, and again, clearly represented by the data today, really need to begin to focus more intently on public health. And, you know, it's really, it, if you think about the most recent census, um, we now know that the proportion of the population over age 55 is increasing at a rate 20 times the population under age 55. That places incredible stress on Medicare and on Medicaid, which by the way is state budgets and on community-based healthcare systems in general, and most importantly on families. We now know that there are things that we can do to help mitigate some of this cost and to get ahead of this through prevention and risk reduction. And the prime leader in that work is the Centers for Disease Control, particularly the Chronic Disease Center, because it does address many of the risk factors that we talked about today from heart disease to diabetes, a physical activity, and of course, the social determinants. Um, but also in particular, CDC's Alzheimer's disease and healthy aging program. Um, we have asked uh, for that budget to be tripled um, from 20 million to 60 million. Tripling sounds like a lot, but when you look at what we have, <laughs> it is so minimal compared to the scope of this problem that, um, you know, we strongly believe that it is time for us to really focus um, more intently on this in this area. Um, there, the House, again, in their appropriations um, bill did um, provide an increase for some of this through the bold centers and also um, chronic, the chronic center in general received an increase, but um, we do not believe that is enough. Um, and we are uh, asking advocates and others to um, really work with the Senate to increase that number up to 60 million um, for the CDC Alzheimer and Healthy Aging Program. Also, um, we've heard from a number of our legislators today about the importance of paid family leave. Um, we really encourage uh, everyone to support the Building an Economy for Families Act and strongly believe that comprehensive paid family and medical leave should be included in any uh, family, uh, any reconciliation package. Um, and those discussions obviously are underway on Capitol Hill and so strongly encourage advocacy around this point. Um, there was reference, um, Representative Sanchez, who's a leader in um, the Change Act, um, to the importance of early detection of cognitive impairment. This is absolutely critical. Um, so basically the Medicare annual wellness visit to which all Medicare beneficiaries are entitled includes a cognitive assessment. Unfortunately, that cognitive assessment um, does not require the use of a validated screening tool. So you, uh, a clinician could basically have a subjective conversation with a patient, oh, how's your memory, it's okay, you know, and to determine whether or not there seems to be an issue we would like additional rigor to this process and we would like to require a more validated tool, an instrument that could be uh, recorded into the electronic health record for better health, brain health uh, tracking. And um, uh, there's so much opportunity here. It, it's, it's hard to um, adequately express, but uh, I think m many on this call probably know that um, really only about 16% of Medicare beneficiaries are taking advantage of this regular uh, visit that is so important, we think, to a lot of the issues around reducing risk and communities of color um, are even worse on that score. So there is a lot of work to be done to improve um, early detection and early intervention in Medicare. Um, and last but not least, um, 
we have been working uh, with many, 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 many partners, um, more than 180 organizations, national organizations have supported a national goal to prevent Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Um, Dr. Hacker made reference to the fact that the National Alzheimer's um, Project Act Advisory Council um, formed a risk reduction subcommittee. Um, I was honored to serve on that with Dr. Lisa McGuire from CDC and Matthew Baumgart from the uh, Alzheimer's Association. Um, that subcommittee presented recommendations yesterday to this National Advisory Council that they add another goal to this plan to address Alzheimer's and that uh, was unanimously accepted by the council as a recommendation that will go to the secretary. Um, we strongly, strongly believe that the secretary of HHS needs to adopt a national goal to reduce the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's as a primary strategy. Um, there, President Biden has talked at great length about his um, commitment to addressing Alzheimer's and uh, the focus on research, which again, incredibly critical, strongly support. And it is also important to think about ways that we can act now to address what we've heard today around the social determinants of health and risk reduction. And there are steps we can take today to do that. There are steps that CDC can take, that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid can take, that HRSA can take, that many other agencies, state and local governments, private sector can take to really, really make a dent in risk reduction and potentially reduce the prevalence of Alzheimer's. Of course, we want a treatment and we're working so hard um, in that regard, um, but we also want to ensure that as few people as possible have to deal with this disease at all. And to the extent that we can reduce the risk and prevent it in the first place, um, that would be ideal. So those are a few of the policy priorities. I'd welcome my colleagues, if there's other flavor or color that you'd like to add to those asks, please do. Um, and we're certainly uh, open to taking uh, questions from those who are participating in the webinar. And I know that a few people um, have been active in the Q&A, um, so we can. And I would just, before we go to questions, just to quick, next slide, to quickly highlight also uh, Brain Guide as a resource, um, a platform that we recently launched, which is available in English and in Spanish to help consumers, individuals in the districts that we highlighted and across the country navigate and understand brain health. So this is an amazing platform that includes rich resources on uh, Alzheimer's education, uh, on memory health and brain health. It even includes a questionnaire that you can use to better understand uh, uh, memory health in yourself or in perhaps a loved one. And again, it's available in English and Spanish. So one, we have a rich set of policy recommendations, but then also want to empower communities uh, and individuals uh, with resources like Brain Guide uh, to enable you to take action today. Uh, on uh, what you've learned. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Kelly, for Q&A. Well, I just wanna say thanks, Jason. I was super remiss in not mentioning that. <laughs> um, and uh, just I, also, um, just just for a sense of how this is being used right now, over 100,000 people have, have, have done this. The demand is incredible. Um, and we're finding um, that the feedback has been terrific in terms of um, the utility of this and the customization that it provides and you know, a great first resource for families. So if you're working with a, uh, on a congressional staff, um, this might actually, I can think of this as a, a newsletter for your congressional um, district. Um, it's a great constituent resource. Um, if you're working with an organization that reaches um, others, um, we would really um, welcome your dissemination of this information and be happy to provide additional toolkits and resources that could help you do that. It's, it's free, um, it's free, it's easy, and, um, and people are finding it um, incredibly useful and helpful as they um, you know, deal with their family's journey with this issue, or even just concerned about their own brain health. And most of the people that are using it actually are um, individuals that um, we found are just interested and concerned about their own cognition and want to learn more. So very helpful resource. Thanks. Okay, questions. Um, let's see what we've got here in the Q&A. Um, 
uh, I'm going to read a question from uh, Melody. Um, Jason, it looks like this might be something that you would want to address. Um, she's saying that um, she's finding that many state and local federal governments and nonprofits have programs to assist underrepresented patients and underserved communities, although the patients are not aware of this. Um, this highlights the importance of communication. Um, what are some of the lessons learned from our efforts um, to enhance communication to these communities um, and ensure a clear path to resources are available? So any actually Dr. Hacker or Jason, others who would like to uh, address that um, would love to um, respond to her question. Sure, um, I would one say uh, definitely taking advantage of resources uh, like uh, the BRFSS um, and a cognitive health module, which includes great data on not just subjective cognitive decline, but also as Dr. Hacker mentioned, uh, caregiver impacts as well. Uh, use that in order to have a more tailored conversation in communities about the impact of um, uh, brain health issues uh, at, in communities. And so I think anything you can do to tailor your narrative, I think is really critical. I think that's why it's important to develop culturally tailored educational materials. And I think another way of doing that is through data, is talking about this from a community specific perspective. Uh, so I would encourage that. And also understanding the community, um, partnering with trusted um, organizations that are serving those communities um, who have a reputation in those communities, relationships in those communities, taking time to understand who those folks are. And that's where I think data can be very powerful. We found that going in and having a conversation with an organization um, and being able to talk about how Alzheimer's impacts their clients at the county level and the county that they serve really changes the kind of conversation that you're able to have um, and to generate partnership uh, and engagement that is meaningful. Thanks, Jason. Um, okay, we have another question from Tracy Cook. Um, perhaps, uh, Dr. Hacker, this um, is something you might be able to address. She's asking about, given, given the awareness of systemic discrimination and racism affecting persons of color, uh, what data efforts are being made to explore some of the um, mental health impacts, cognitive health impacts of these factors on early onset late dementia and Alzheimer's disease? I, I wonder, I know that social determinants is a priority for the center. Um, how is CDC taking a look at um, systemic racism as part of this work? Oop, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I think here at CDC, there's a big effort going on to really address health equity um, across all of the, certainly all of our por portfolio in chronic diseases. And so, you know, both being able to collect the appropriate data so that we can identify where some of these challenges are occurring, but also how do we message appropriately? How do we make sure that the information that we're providing uh, is, a, is going to resonate with different communities and where are the resources going? And I think those are questions that we're asking across all of our notice of funding opportunities, uh, including obviously Alzheimer's work. I mean, just the, the type of things you're doing now, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system that you mentioned, um, we've actually got modules that hopefully that will be uh, upcoming that will address both social determinants and racism. And I think it's those kinds of efforts that will help us really understand the interplay here, but also be able to target our resources appropriately. Terrific, thank you. Um, and we have another question around the direct care workforce and the shortage of qualified direct care providers. Um, and also because uh, she mentions, or he mentions, um, because care providers themselves are more likely to face poor social determinants of health, um, given how um, underpaid and poorly treated they are in the US. It's been a challenging year for health providers, no doubt. Um, uh, well, one, I'll mention one thing and then perhaps others may have a response to this, but I will say that um, in the recommendations that the risk reduction subcommittee made to the Napa Council yesterday, workforce was a top consideration. There was a lot of discussion among the participants in that effort about 
um, the need to strengthen the public health workforce. That's been a priority across, um, I believe, CDC and HRSA and many other agencies and definitely in the private sector. So um, we um, uh, concur and agree that there needs to be a greater focus in this area and support for primary care in particular and, and community-based care um, as well. Yeah, and I would just add, and I know we're at time, so I'll close it up after this, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to more questions, but um, you know, I agree. I think we need to strengthen the public health workforce. COVID has underscored that in a way that is tragic, um, but is hard. we cannot ignore. Um, second, uh, I think there's a lot of focus right now on the idea of care as infrastructure, the importance of investing in caregiving whether that's unpaid care, uh, the 16 million individuals providing unpaid care for um, loved ones living with Alzheimer's disease, or the paid workforce uh, as well that is providing that support, which is proportionally is Black, Latino, uh, lower income women of color. So really thinking about these individuals, these professions as essential, uh, and thinking about that even beyond the pandemic is critical. And that's why we're calling for, as a step in that direction, the importance of a paid family medical leave policy, but also supporting home and community-based supports as well. And tied into that is the support for the workforce. So um, thank you so much uh, to Dr. Hacker, uh, to Dr. Perez, uh, to Representative Sanchez and Horsford and my colleague Kelly O'Brien, and to all of you for joining us as we release this data and build the case and momentum and empower stakeholders with tools uh, to make public health a more essential and vital part of our Alzheimer's response, particularly in communities of color. So thank you so much. Uh, all of this is available on our website. You can go to brainhealthdata.org and we'll make sure everyone gets uh, this in a wrap up email. But on that, we have a page with the report with resources from the CDC. Today's webinar will be archived there. We have a legislative agenda that we've released through our C4. So it's rich materials um, for policymakers, staff, and also public health stakeholders. So we look forward to sharing that with you. Thank you so much. Have a great week.